Sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> I am Jason Hemingway. Uh, Doug's gonna, Doug Weishon, we're, we're both in retirement plan services. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit about financial wellness. And we thought, you know, it's a, it's a great idea to, to touch on this uh, this topic all the time. We talk about it all the time. Uh, I'm an educator in RPS, and Doug is an officer. He's the admin, he's a client relationship manager in RPS. And so we talk about financial wellness a lot. Uh, we wanted to share some different types, maybe a different angle at it a little bit with you guys. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we're going to do is talk about, uh, you know, what financial wellness means. And we understand that it means probably something different to everybody, a little bit anyway. I mean, some people think of financial wellness as just peace of mind, and, and that's great. Some people might think of it as, um, as it says here, and then financial wellness means being comfortable with where you are today, financially, while planning for tomorrow. And this doesn't necessarily mean being wealthy. Although some people maybe it does. Um, but really, you're in control of your current and future finances. And I think that that in control is a big part of financial wellness. Is you are in control. And certainly what we're going to talk about, I love this definition, because it feeds into your current and your future finances. And that's, that's the first place we're going to start, is we'll start to talk about, I'll talk about where you are today. We'll talk about assets and liability. We'll talk about debt. And we'll talk about credit. Um, certainly when, it, when we're talking about financial wellness, those are two places to start, and that's why I put those in the, where are you today? You need to know where you are today uh, before you can really start to look towards the future and hopefully get to uh, a place where you feel like you're financially well. And so we'll take a look at this step to improve your financial wellness as well. And so that's one of the things that I know, we hope you have some takeaways. I mean, some of this stuff we understand is gonna be pretty common sense stuff. Some of the stuff that, you're gonna, that we're gonna go over You've probably already heard before. We hope that you take away some things, uh, maybe some steps to help you improve it. Maybe just one. Maybe just one step to go, okay, that, that sounds great. I'll try that. Uh, that's what we hope you have you take away today. We're going to talk about where you are today, uh, plan for your tomorrow. We're going to talk about your Union Bank retirement plan. Jeff Aldrich is your uh, educator for the retirement plan from Union Bank. He unfortunately couldn't make it today. So Jeff, or Doug and I will, will go ahead and go over that piece with you. But if you do have specific questions uh, later, um, maybe that we can't answer, we'll try, but if we can't, then, then certainly Jeff Aldrich is, is the expert, the, uh, the educator on that plan. And then we'll talk about, uh, Doug will talk about Rhett Direct, uh, certainly talk about your, your website account. Um, and then we'll talk about financial resources. And Doug's gonna talk about uh, the, the retirement education website, uh, and certainly navigating the education website, but also financial tools. And that's kind of that in the takeaway piece. Uh, I'm gonna start with where you are today, uh, hopefully you'll get some takeaway pieces as far as resources and tools to help you become financially well. So, where are you today? Very important <coughs> to determine where you are today by listing your assets and your liabilities down on a sheet. What sheet? Well, we have, and Doug's going to touch on this too, but we have uh, a lot of these types of things. And he's going to show you some of these things on the website. But we have a lot of these tools, these resources, these worksheets. And certainly on this worksheet you can list uh, what you own versus what you owe. Pretty self-explanatory, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty standard. Subtract your liabilities from your assets. Kind of get an idea where you are. Determine if your debt is good or bad debt. What does that mean? Well, here's a list of good debt versus bad debt. And it's important to know the difference. It's important to know you do have some good debt. Mortgages, uh, business loans, school loans. Bad debt though, things that just do not have any value. Appliances and furniture debt, vacation debt, leases, and the all-important revolving credit card debt. And I could just usually just say credit cards, period, because that's, that's where I think a lot of folks get into, into trouble as far as getting behind in their search or quest for financial wellness, and that's credit card debt. So let's touch a little bit on, on credit card debt a little bit. FICO, Fair Isaac Corporation Company, came up with this uh, standard idea of coming up with credit card credit scores. And, and all they're doing is allowing lenders to take a snapshot into your credit, uh, credit report at certain points in time to come up with a score. So here's a list of the scores. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this or if you know where you are, hopefully you do, or have an idea of where you are, but 723 is excellent, or is average. 620 to 674 could mean as much as a 2% difference um, in, in certain rates that lenders give to you. I'm gonna show you an illustration of what just 1% will look like. So 2% is pretty significant when you start talking about the difference in rates. 560 to 619 is considered subprime. Anything under 500 is considered unacceptable. So what affects your credit score? Well, your insurance rates, job search, cell phones, landlords, a lot of these places use 
your credit score just to determine if you're financially responsible, if you can make payments, are you making payments on time? Well, insurance companies actually will use your credit score for uh, a different reason. They actually realize, and they use statistics that will say that if you have a lower credit score, you're more likely to have a claim. And so they actually might use that, your credit score, to determine what your rate's gonna be, your insurance rate. I didn't know that before I started doing this presentation before. So that's, that's very interesting to me. Um, the, the example is a 30-year mortgage on a $150,000 loan, paying 3% versus 4%. It could mean $30,000. That's just 1%. We talked about 2% being 620 to 674. So you can see $30,000 of the life of the loan just for a 1% difference in your, in your rate. That's pretty, I think that's pretty significant. What counts? What do they use? Well, they use your payment history to, to determine you. 35% of it, and that's good or bad. Um, so it doesn't always mean, oh my gosh, my, my payment history, it's, if it's bad, it's going to hurt me. Well, if it's good, it's going to help you. Um, so that's a big determination as well. And always think about these things as, as opposites, too. It doesn't always mean bad stuff. I mean, this is all good stuff helping your credit report as well. How much do you owe? Max out cards. Are you using 10 to 30%? That's an important part, too, because one of the things that I'm going to talk about as far as helping you get out of credit card debt is the fact that I think some people think that once they get uh, they max out or they get it all paid off, they should just close it out. And that's, that's not the case. What we want to do is see what lenders will take a look at and see if you're using less than 30%. If you're using less than 30% and it's still open, that proves to them that you have financial responsibility. So uh, your length of credit history is important. Quality work, uh, it, uh, as well there. New credit, uh, are you applying for a single loan or are you out there applying all over the place for all kinds of different department store cards or whatever it may be? Uh, and then the mix, what kind of cards do you have, lines of credit, your mortgage, et cetera. That plays about 10% into your, into your credit score. So how do you boost your score? <laughs> Keep balances low, that's obvious. Pay off debt rather than moving it from card to card. You know, closing the account doesn't make it go away. And I think that's an important thing to, to take away. I think a lot of people, hopefully we realize that now. I, I've talked to, to, to folks that do sort of start to realize that, you know, you don't always just want to get, get it paid off and cut it off. Closing it doesn't make it go away. Um, but because what creditors will do is they'll take a look and see, okay, are you, do you have three or four cards? And if you have 10, 12 different cards, that, that may be a different story. But if you've got three or four cards, if you're using less than 30%, say you're losing, using just 10%, like I said, that really proves to them that you are financially responsible. You're not out there just maxing out every card that you have. And so that's important. Check your credit report regularly. I'm going to show you how to do that. If you missed a payment, obviously you want to get current. But where do you get your credit report? Did you guys, are you guys aware of this by chance? That annualcreditreport.com is the only place where you can get a free uh, credit report each year. And it, it takes one, and you get one free per uh, per agency here, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Those are the three largest credit reporting agencies. That's why those three are used. Um, the other part is what's, what's nice is most places, and I don't know if this is true for all places, but most places will actually uh, look at all three scores when they're determining wh whether or not to give you a loan or, or, or a line of credit or so. And they'll use that medium. They'll, they'll, they, they're using three of them so they can see the high, the low, and then they'll use the medium one. Uh, whatever one that may be. But you can get a free credit report from each one of these uh, reporting agencies each year. A lot of places will tell you that you can get a free credit score, but you're not going to get a free credit, your full credit report uh, from anywhere other than these, than these three agencies. So take advantage of that. Steps to improve your financial wellness. And by the way, <coughs> before we get too far past, I have a bunch of these. And this is all talking about FICO scores. This is about a 20-page booklet um, that I got just directly offline. And, and if you guys want one of these, I brought a bunch of them. Uh, you guys you know, feel free to grab them. They're just going to give you all kinds of different um, uh, information um, on FICO scores and how to improve your scores and all kinds of things. A lot more detail than what I talked about. So feel free. I also have um, those net worth worksheets as well, so you can determine your liabilities. And obviously, this is online. Doug's going to get into it as well. But I wanted to show you what they look like. And if you do want one, Feel free to come up and grab one of those as well. So how do we improve? Well, the first step, obviously, is to analyze your current spending. And obviously, your budget is going to help you with this. But really, uh, you want to figure out where your money is going. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. But this is one this is an example of uh, you know, somebody's, they're using 20 to 30% um, of their money each month on housing, and so, so on and so forth. And so it's really important to analyze where your money is going. A really nice place to do that is from Mint.com, from my, from my understanding. Using a budgeting site like that, 
will actually help you. Uh, now, I understand there's, there's, there's some things that go along with that side. I don't use it. Um, I've heard people that do that, that said that, you know, a lot of times it gets a little bit annoying as far as how it kind of screams at you and says you're, you're spending too much money on food. Uh, uh, yeah, we know that. We're hungry. Um, you know, that's, the, that, that's, that's one of the glitches I've heard about that site, but really what it comes down to is it's a nice site to let you know exactly where you are. Where is your money going? And that's, that's one way to go. Um, certainly, you know, worksheets. And we have these as well, and these are budgeting worksheets. This is all part of your website as far as um, what your tools and resources are. So I have a bunch of these too if you want. If you're more of a paper person, which is totally fine, this, this is a nice budgeting worksheet that we have as well. So, there's different places to do that. The main point, as you can see in the bold, is to create a budget. And a lot of people don't do this, and it's really important to do uh, in order to be financially well. You've got to figure out where your money is going uh, before you can even start to plan for the future. So, ranking debts by interest rate, listing debts smallest to largest, working on paying off the smallest balances. If you coincide that with the last bullet point, ranking debts by interest rate can accelerate those payments on the highest ones. If you put those two things together, you'll have a nice starting point to start to pay down some of that debt. And then, of course, borrow only when it makes sense. Um, and I think we're all, we all get kind of caught up in that. Sometimes we borrow when we don't necessarily always need to. Only when it makes sense. Um, really need to calculate your debt to income ratio. It's important to do that. It's simple, you know, monthly debt payments divided by your monthly pre-tax income and try to stay under 30%. And a lot of folks will look at this. I mean, a lot of lenders will look at this. What's your debt to income ratio? They won't even lend to you uh, if they uh, feel like your debt to income ratio isn't right. So it's important to stay under 30%. And of course, determine if you're borrowing for something that's gonna retain value uh, or something that's going to lose value over time. Plan for the future. So we're gonna transition into, away from today, uh, and a little bit into the future. Short-term goals, emergency funds. Um, I know for the most part, uh, people that I know have talked about emergency funds, talk about six months worth of expenses. I kinda like this where it says three to six months. It's not always possible for everybody to have six months worth of expenses saved just in your emergency fund. So uh, the three to six months seems maybe a little bit more attainable. I don't wanna, we don't wanna scare anybody away. Uh, certainly, anything in your emergency fund is important, but it has to be liquid. You have to be able to get to it. It's got to be something that you can attain quickly. Uh, it's an emergency fund. It's there for a reason. Midterm goal, I want to save $5,000 for a down payment in three or five years. So we've got a short-term goal, got a midterm goal, long-term goal, college education. Kelly would tell you, college education is rising. Uh, the cost of, of, of uh, secondary education is rising quicker than health care, if I, if, I, if I read that correctly something you always said. Uh, that's, that's astounding to think of that. So that is certainly a, uh, a long-term goal to think about if you have children. And then the longer-term goal, what we'll transi transition into is your retirement plan. Uh, you know, I want, I want $200,000 for retirement in 20 years. How do you get there? Through your retirement plan uh, or accounts if you have multiple. So let's talk about that just a little bit. Your Union Bank retirement account, very important. Just gonna touch on some of the basics. Matching contribution, 25 cents per dollar up to 6%. 100% uh, vested. Your participants are allowed to make changes. You guys are allowed to make changes uh, the first of each month. Profit sharing contribution is discretionary. Traditionally, it's been 6%. I will say this, we work with a lot of plans. 6% is very generous. Um, I, I see a lot of one, two, three percent. I see a lot more of that than they do 6%. So uh, our, our plan here is, is very, very generous. You guys all understand vesting. I know those guys too. Um, just means ownership. What do you have ownership in? Uh, you have ownership in everything you put into your plan, obviously, and anything the company has put in puts you on a vesting schedule. So after five years, you have 100% ownership in whatever the company has put in. If you do decide to leave the company uh, before you get to that point, you can see the percentage of the money that you have ownership in that you'll take with you. Uh, hopefully, you'll roll over. Not take a long time. Um, <laughs> We like to show this option. There's a lot of people that we that we deal with uh, as far as participants that do not uh, always know what their investment options are. We're not going to get into, get into great detail with those, but we do want to mention the fact that these uh, Vanguard retirement funds uh, are certainly an option for us here. Um, and all these are are these are these were basically rolled out by Vanguard uh, for folks that really do not understand the market. They don't really like to do investing. They don't really like to do all the research that goes along with that. And so we have a nice option here. These Vanguard retirement funds are fantastic because what they are 
is they're just based uh, pretty much solely on your age and when you are going to retire, your target retirement date. So, for instance, if you were, you know, if you were a very, very, very young person, you would be in the 2055 fund. You don't have to choose that. It's just that's just what Vanguard is saying. They're they're saying that based on your age, this is how we believe you should be allocated. And the nice thing about these is that Vanguard said, look, we have we're throwing a lot of investment choices at people that don't understand this. We're throwing a lot of things at them that look Greek. And so what we want to do is take all the guesswork out of this for people and help them with their retirement. So we're going to do everything for them. We're going to allocate for them. Uh, we're going to make sure they're diversified. And, and we're going to make sure that they become more conservative over time as they get closer to retirement. So that's very, very nice in terms of an option that you guys, that we all have. Uh, and, and one that I, like I said, I, I'm not sure everybody's aware of that we have that option. So that's why we talk about these. Hand it over to Doug. We're going to talk a little bit about Rec Direct before we get into uh, other resources. Very good. For all of you that may not know it, we have a subsidiary in North Carolina called Retirement Direct. Um, we bought this uh, record keeping company a long time ago, and uh, uh, Dan Brenner is the individual who used to be here in Lincoln, is now running that in North Carolina, but that's where our Union Bank retirement plan is, is housed at. And that's where the record keeping's done and everything, and so everything's all confidential and, and, and uh, kind of maintained in North Carolina. Uh, this is their website. If you haven't been out to RepDirect.net, uh, I would recommend you do that. And uh, if you need to get your initial login information, you can give us a call in, uh, at uh, 1592. 1592, and we can get you set up with. Uh, your initial login, and then you can establish a personal login after that. A lot of information you can get on your retirement account itself. Uh, it's going to come up with kind of a summary of where you're invested, your different balances. We maintain uh, what's called sources of money. So you've got your 401k source of money. It's uh, you've got a, a match source. You've got a profit sharing source. You can roll money into this plan from another prior employer if you want to take advantage of these investments and the and the, the low cost option here uh, so we keep track of all those different sources uh, independently so you can kind of track and see when when contributions come in uh, you can do a lot of information you, here's where you would submit a, a deferral change uh, we would highly recommend if you're not up to the six percent level to where you're getting the full company match that you, you work your way toward that six percent deferral uh, rate. Uh, I myself, my, my kids are out of college now, so I can I can start pumping in some money. So I'm, I'm, uh, this is a good time for individuals once you get to where you can afford to do that a little bit more to, to pump up that deferral rate and get that money into the plan. <coughs> you do have the option of either doing a, a pre-tax deferral, uh, which is kind of a traditional 401k, or Roth deferrals. Uh, it's kind of a question of you want to pay the tax now or you want to pay it later. Uh, for a lot of younger people who are maybe in a lower tax bracket right now, uh, Roth makes a lot of sense. You can pay the, ta uh, pay the tax now on uh, what you're putting into the plan. Um, it grows tax-free so that when you take the money out at, uh, after age 59 and a half and it, it, the money's Roth the has been in there at least five years, uh, then all those earnings come out tax-free. So when you hit retirement, if you've got traditional deferrals, and of course the employer contributions are going to be pre-tax, but uh, anything you take out in retirement, you have to pay taxes on. Well, the Roth is a very good option in that uh, your company money will be taxable, but this Roth money will not be taxable. So it's just like taking money out of your savings account, you've already paid tax on. So it works really good. It, typically works better for younger people because they've got more time for that money to grow and all those earnings to be tax-free. So you've got the option there to, to pick a, a traditional or a Roth or you can put a little bit in both if you want. Uh, you can change your investment elections. Let's see, it says investment percentage, future contributions. Basically it'll show you where your current money is, all the different options you put in your new percentages and, and uh, it will make those investments switches for you. 
You can look at uh, your investment performance, your personally, how your account has done. It's tracked out all the way back uh, for a couple of years. And so you can see uh, how you perform. You can uh, do, uh, look at the actual investment options and see what the performance has been on the different <coughs> investment options. So you can compare and contrast all the things that are available. So basic uh, your ways to monitor your account would be, uh, number one, you're going to get a quarterly statement from us. Uh, please take time to open that envelope and take a look at it. Uh, lots of times we're going to make some investment option changes. We monitor the investments that are available on the 401k side. And um, uh, per periodically we're going to find that a fund is underperforming or, or we can get into a cheaper share class of a certain fund. All those announcements and things like that are in that envelope. So please take a look at it, you know, take, take five seconds to, to read through it so you understand what's happening within the plan. Um, part of your account, you will notice, is in a general investment fund. Um, Union banks always had a very paternalistic <coughs> approach to the retirement plan in that you can direct the investment of your 401k money because you're putting that in but the company would like to uh, direct the investment of the profit sharing in the match. That's just the way it's always been. Um, it's currently, uh, it currently runs between 65 and 70% in the stock market and, and 35 to 30 to 35 percent in the bond market. So uh, Ryan Saylor um, in uh, UIMG is primarily responsible for uh, managing that mix of investments. We do have a a separate money manager that handles the bonds, and then we have a couple of uh, stock fund accounts. So there's some bank stock in there, so we get to you know also um, benefit from how the bank does because that affects the price of the bank stock. So it works out really well. Uh, a VRU, uh, I don't have the phone number on the VRU, but um, um, it, it's pretty antiquated. You got to press a lot of buttons to work your way through it. So I. I, I or recommend uh, accessing retdirect.net. You can either uh, get into that just directly to that website or you can get into it through Kronos or uh, the U as well. Anybody have any questions on how to get in there on your account? Okay. Financial resources. Uh, some of you may not know this, but we provide retirement plan services for most of the major employers in Lincoln. Um, also statewide, uh, we've got uh, clients all over the place. Uh, our education department is about how many people now? Six, seven people in our education department? Five. Four. Five? Five. Okay, five people. <laughs> um, they've designed this uh, ubt.com slash education website. And it's kind of designed in ages and stages. So we've got uh, the 20s to 30s and some topics within that, if you click on that, it'll take you some topics that are, we think are important for people that, in that age group, 30s to 50s, 50s to 60s, and 60s and beyond. So you can just click on any of those four topics and that'll take you to a list of, of information related to uh, things that you might find interesting for that age group. Uh, I'd like to point out, way over on the left there, retirement calculators. That's. Um, where we're going to go next. Oh, no. Uh, these are some of the topics we find under the 30s to 50s. Uh, some characteristics, uh, statistics, uh, some information about estate planning, spending and debt, uh, growing your nest egg, maximizing savings, things like that. Then there's also these calculators. Uh, if you or like me, or getting closer to retirement, you want to kind of see uh, if you're going to be able to get out at 65 or 67 or 70 or whatever. Um, you kind of want to know, is this nest egg building to where I need it to be? Uh, one good thing about this calculator is you can, uh, you, know, you can put in there how much is, is going into your account right now. If you're contributing six and the company's contributing six, that would be a 12% number. 
Uh, you've got your annual salary, <coughs> annual salary increase. Bank's been about 3% historically here. Your current age. This is the age where you'd like to retire. Maybe that's 62, who knows. Uh, here's your current balance. Now, you can put in here, this is your 401k balance, if, if you know that from your latest quarterly statement, but you can also add to that any personal savings you have um, or IRAs you might have outside the plan. So uh, you, can, you can plug a number in here. Your annual rate of return, we've got a 7%, I think there's a default 7% number. That's kind of what you think your account will grow on an annual basis. Last year we were lucky, it was probably close to 30% in the stock market. You're not going to have that. You're going to have some highs and lows, so this would be kind of an average rate of return over the years. Um, and the company match, you can put the 25% on 6% there in order to figure out your company match. And then it will take your current balance and run that out to age 65 and kind of see where it thinks it's going to take you. In this case, with the match, uh, $756,000. That's, that's a pretty good nest egg. Now, if you want to find out how long is that going to last, we also have uh, another calculator the, uh, where you can put in what you think that nest egg and the prior case was 756000 you can put that number in here how much you want to spend every year in retirement now this would be just out of this account if you're going to get 2000 in uh, social security hopefully 2000 a month how much more do you think you're going to need per month you know another 2500 or another a month. It depends on how much you want to live on in retirement. So this would have to be how much you want to spend annually in retirement. In this case, it's fifty thousand. What's going to be your after-tax rate of return in retirement? Uh, you know, typically uh, up to retirement age, you, you can be a little more aggressive with your investments. I think we had a seven percent return in there, probably because they had a little bit more money in the stock market. Once you hit retirement age, people tend to be a little more conservative move kind of out of stocks into bonds uh, where there's less volatility. So your rate of return is going to be lower. In this case, they've got a 5% rate of return. Expected inflation rate, this is at 5, but uh, yeah, that's more like 3 or 4%. And then you can see how long your money's going to last. In this case, uh, okay, uh, this, from 2014 all the way to 2034, so 20 years of retirement. So for this person from 65 <coughs> to 85, they'll be able to live, they'll be able to pull out 50,000 a year from 65 to 85. That's not too bad. Although people are living into their 90s now, so maybe this isn't uh, going to quite get you as far as you need to go. But it's a very good calculator, at least, you know, if you know what your, your current savings is right now, kind of what your nest egg, is, nest egg is right now, you can do these projections and then see how long that's going to last. So. Definitely take your time to do that. Can I ask a question? Sure. How, how do you put in the profit sharing? I mean, what figure Well, is that would be back here in your current balance, where, you, where you've got your current balance here, and then you've got the 6% company money in with what your deferral rate is. So if you're putting in 6 and the company's putting in 6, you put 12 in here on the percent to contribute. So that's realistic to put in 6% profit sharing? Well, yeah. I mean, that's all. There? That's all we've got to go on is historically they've been putting in 6%. So okay. and this is just a projection anyway, so it's not a guarantee. Yeah, this is not a guarantee. <laughs> <coughs> Any other questions on how to work these? It's really eye-opening. Uh, you can uh, also, there's a Social Security benefit calculator if you want to uh, to run that. Again, you've got your current age, your retirement age, your annual income, your expected salary increase, and expected uh, inflation rate, and then it'll kind of give you an idea. Uh, Social Security may provide 30, almost $34,000 to this person at age 65. So that's over 2,000 a month. That's pretty good. There's also a budget calculator, and, and we talked a little bit about um, the budget information you can get on paper. You can also put in some information here into the budget calculator uh, and then do the calculate, you know, your monthly income, some of your monthly expenses, 
and kind of get a pie chart and see where you're at with that. So we want to, you know, let you know that uh, you know, determine where you're at today, get a good feel for you know what all your income and expenses are, what your assets are. Uh, create a budget that'll help you know a little bit better as to where your money is going. If you, uh, when you have more month left than you have paycheck, uh, check your credit report annually. It's free. You might as well do it. It's a pretty pretty detailed report. I, I did mine not too long ago and it, it had some old, it's still got some old credit cards that I thought I got rid of a long time ago. I just, you know, didn't use them and cut them up and I probably need to go back and somehow close those accounts, but you'll, you'll be surprised. It's also a good way to find out if anybody's tried to open up a credit card under your name. So uh, fraud, fraud wise, it's best to check that every year. Uh, manage your debt, plan for your future. Uh, like. Jason said Union Bank's got a great retirement plan. Uh, you're getting a 6% plus the 1.5% match. That's 7.5. If you're putting in 6, you've got 13.5% going into the plan every year for you. Uh, advisors suggest you put in between 12 and 15% a year. So if we've got 13.5, you know, just from, uh, from the company and us, then, then we're kind of pretty much on target with what uh, the suggested savings rate is for retirement. And uh, use your financial resources. Uh, at any time, you can make an appointment to come over to uh, Pine Lake, or we can meet you over here if you'd like to sit down and, and, and talk about uh, the, your union bank plan account. Uh, we do a lot of uh, you know, just discussions if you've got um, if you're approaching retirement, you don't know what your options are for taking withdrawals and how that works. Uh, if you've uh, been in another employer and you've left a 401k there, uh, they probably want to get rid of you. They don't want to keep tracking you and paying for you. So you can roll that in. We can help you with the paperwork and things like that to, to roll that money into this plan. So uh, we're there to help you and provide you any resources you might need. Make sure you're happy with the retirement. When you were talking about the traditional IRA versus the Roth, is there a certain person, a certain point when you either make enough income or you're just no longer young anymore and you should switch to more of the traditional? Well, Roth hasn't been around too much, too many years. So for me, I was a little bit late to, to use it. I um, um, didn't feel like. I would probably get enough benefit for the growth until I want to start pulling it out. So um, it's, it's hard to say. It it's kind of depends on uh, how much pre-tax savings you have now. Um, if you want to create a bucket with the Roth deferrals as, a, as an after-tax kind of bucket of money, so that when you do hit retirement, you can kind of play with those two buckets to control your taxable income. That may work. Um, it, it works best for young people because you get that, that all that growth and the, over the years of the investments uh, that all comes out tax free. Uh, so in order to be there long enough to, to get the benefit of that tax free growth, it, probably somebody uh, under, 30, under 40, Probably would benefit from Roth a little bit better than people in their 50s and 60s. Good question. I, yeah, I think I think one of the questions that you could ask yourself is, wait, am I making the most money that I'm ever going to make in my lifetime right now? And, and so, do I want to be taxed right now? And I, I, we always talk to folks about asking yourself, when do I want to be taxed? And that's really an important question when you're when you're starting to talk about traditional versus Roth. And Roth, obviously, you're going to get taxed right now. So if you're making the most money right now that you'll ever make in your lifetime, or you think you are, do you want to be taxed right now? And that's kind of the determination, I think, when we start talking about that with folks, is it, it, it is an estimate. I mean, do you, do you know when you're gonna be making the most money? I think most of the time we talk about the accumulation years and when you're gonna be making the most money. And like Doug said, you know, post 40 is usually about that time. So, uh, you know, do you really want to be taxed at that point uh, or, you know, or earlier when you're probably just starting out and not making quite as much? Um, that's a question, that's a personal question, but it's certainly something to think about. 
sir. I have a credit card at another institution. I went online to close it, and I read some verbiage there that said that uh, closing a credit card can negatively affect your credit score. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how so? There's probably uh, <coughs> consumer loan people in here maybe who kind of understand that a little bit more than I do, but. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. I mean, what was the credit limit on? Because it's how much you could spend according to how much you have spent. So if you close out something that's got a $20,000 credit limit, you're changing your ratio, which you don't want to do. You just don't use it. Yeah, and in that vein, I mean, lenders will take a look and see how financially responsible you are with what money you have available to you. And so without having that available to you, you're not proving, I mean, you, there's nothing there for you to prove. If you've got all that money available to you and you're not using it, that's really financially responsible. And so that, that really helps uh, the determination from lenders. But don't they, after a certain length of time, credit cards eventually do close you out just because you haven't used them? I mean, I've had that. And again, it, it, it's not always, yeah, as far as that, but if you have a balance, and that's one of, that's one of the things why they say keep your balance between 10 and 30 percent, is, is use it, um, but keep it low. I mean, it's not necessarily just, just have it open, don't use it, It's which would be fine, sure, but if you keep that balance between 10 and 30 percent, they're not going to close you out because you have a balance there, and you've, you know, you, that's why they say keep, you know, keep using it, but keep it low. That way, you, if you're in between that 10 and 30 percent, you're showing you improving financial responsibility that way. Gone. We don't use those anymore. Right. We had a business that they're, they're no longer used, so they're gradually. Well, and, and, I, and I, understand, I understand that. I, I think the other part of that is do you need 10 of them? I mean, it, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a certain, yeah, right. I mean, so, you know, if you've got one credit card, and, you know, again, it, it's, not, it's not quite as, as advantageous to you just to have one. But is it advantageous to you to have 15? I mean, that's, you know, it's that fine line, that middle ground that, that, that lenders will look at. I just have a comment to kind of go along with that. I worked in the with the consumer loans area for a long time, and I think the balance of what you're saying is really important. But I think one thing that lenders also look at when they're going to approve you for a loan is what you have available and what could you spend. So if I have $20,000 loan on my card, if we're going to look at approving you for a loan, and we're going to say, okay, right now, your debt to income ratio is within the means of approving you, but what could it be if I have this availability? So there is a very fine balance of what you have available showing good financial responsibility, but the lender's side is also looking at what's the risk. How risky are you as a borrower when you have this stuff available that you're not using right now? So, yeah, I would just echo that. Yeah, it's very important. There's really no definition of what's good, what's bad, it's just right. knowing that's a good. correct point. I like how you use the word risk. I mean that's what they're determining is 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 your risk right. uh, to pay it back. That's a good point. Thanks Doug. Doug, I need to rebalance my investments. And I'm too scared to do it on my own. Because I don't understand it well enough. Sure. Is there how do we do it? Is there someone who's who could guide me through as far as timing and exactly what to do and how to do it? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do as educators. We do that all the time. And it's a matter of, yes, you have to do that yourself online, but we can certainly be there with you. We can certainly talk about, you know, all your options. Ultimately, it comes down to you making those decisions, but... But you can tell me what to do and when to do it. Well, we can't. <laughs> 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 there is a, nice there is a, a free line current balance uh, category. Basically, kind of what Debbie's touching on is, is for you personally, you've decided how much risk you want to take in and that basically means how much do you want to invest in the stock market because that's the riskiest piece of your investing. Well, last, and say you, you said personally, I don't want to put more than 60% of my balance in the stock market. So I'm going to go, I'm going to pick some investments here that have 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Okay, so you're comfortable with that. You don't feel like you're taking any more risk than you want. Well, last year the stock market went way up. Okay, so if you looked at your pie chart right now, you might be 75% in the stock market and 25% in the bond market. Okay. You, now you're taking way more risk than you 
are intended to take just because of the fact that the balance changes every night and we had this big run up in the stock market. Rebalancing your account basically means taking those profits, that 15% profit you've got in your stock portfolio, uh, selling that now and buying back into the, into the bonds in order to get you back down to that 60-40 ratio. Okay. You do want to monitor your account. Now, if you're, if you're using one of those Vanguard target funds, they, they do that for you. Uh, they keep those percentages exactly where they need to be. But if you're picking and choosing your own funds, you're, you're probably way out of whack now. Uh, and that's where you can go back in here and realign your current balance, which basically means buying and selling to get back to that 60-40 or whatever percentage you've been comfortable with. Right? It's basically taking some profits on the things that have run, run up. Actually, Vanguard is the most inexpensive mutual fund company out there. But I mean, so relative to a Vanguard, like just a separate one that's not constantly being rebalanced for you know 2050 or whatever. Sure, it is, it I more um, expensive. I think they're in the the point two seven range yeah. versus the point one seven. So very minuscule investment management fee related to that. So if it's your laziness, it might be worth. <laughs> rebalancing yourself versus yeah, not uh, having the knowledge. Personally, I, I tried to, and, and I've got the knowledge, but I tried to pick and choose funds for years and uh, never seemed to be able to, you know, beat the market. So I, I, I went to one of those Vanguard target funds. And I, I'm happy with it. And I'll let them manage it. And, you know, and, uh, there's differences between uh, Target funds are, are a passively managed fund. They're just picking some indexes. They want to do what the stock market does. They want to do what the bond market does as a whole. They just want to try and meet what's happening in the market. Versus your other investment options are, are called actively managed, where the managers are trying to beat the market. Um, and they want their performance to, uh, you know, they want to accumulate money so they can uh, to beat the market and they'll earn their fee. Over long periods of time, over history, the index funds or the passively managed funds and the active managed funds have pretty much averaged out to be. So, so. Why is the Vanguard cost more if it's considered passive then? Like if they're just switching out funds, why are they well, more? Well, actually Vanguard at a .27 or .17 is cheaper than your actively managed funds. They're at a, probably at a .75 or .85 or .125. They're, they're definitely charging you more. Don't ignore your retirement. <laughs> Don't ignore uh, your budget. Yeah. We have those sheets up here. And uh, they control your financial wellness. There you go. <laughs>